So how are we today? I'm sort of hearing it from this side of the room. I need it. How are we today? Much better. So I want to get the energy high because uh, Reverend Brian knows this already because, I mean, he does it on purpose, though. There are times when ministers step on people's toes. And sometimes it's, you know, like you're, you're in a dance with someone you love and you dance and you step and they're willing to forgive you because they're like they're enjoying the dance and you're like, OK, I'll let that one slide. But then there are times when we step on folks' toes and they're like, oh, <laughs> this might be one of those moments. So let's breathe. <laughs> and and, and, and let, me, let me wait a minute, wait a minute. And let me just throw this out there and let you know that I'm be stepping on my own today, too. So it's not just. But let us breathe. <sighs> so have you ever gotten into a conversation and it starts off with, so how are you today? And someone says, oh, you know, same old, same old. We may have even said it ourselves. For example, there are times when Tracy and I are going to Pittsburgh to visit my mom or my mom calls or I call her because she never calls me. I call her <laughs> and Tracy says, so how was the conversation? And I say, you know, she's same old, same old. Nothing has changed. And then I sit back for a moment and think about it. Is that the truth? Or is that just me being extremely comfortable in this consciousness of nothing really changes? But things do change. Like things are constantly changing, but we sometimes get into this consciousness or this paradigm, this belief system that it's the same old stuff. Like, how often do we watch the news about whatever's going on on the news? And we get into this rote thing of, it's the same old, just different people. <laughs> and yet, we being the spiritual folks, how often do we come back to principle and say that there is a power and a presence that is unchanging in terms of it is constant. The now and the place of power is constant. And yet, as we experience that which is the divine, we do change. Like the manner in which, for example, we believe that heaven is within and we experience it to the degree that we become conscious of it. So that means my understanding, my level of understanding what it means to have heaven within could very well be very different than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, et cetera, of us, correct? Because I'm going to experience my understanding of God's source, the universe, based upon where I am. There's a minister, Reverend Jim Lockhart, who wrote a book called The Beloved Community. And in there, he makes this reference and says, that on any given Sunday when a minister gives the sermon, the talk, the message, depending on where the congregation is and their levels of awareness and awakeness, one sermon becomes 50. Because it's going to be heard at whatever level of consciousness we receive it. Do we really sit with that and question what does it mean for us to hear whatever it is we are hearing, whatever it is we are receiving, whatever it is we are giving. Because every word we speak, we're giving a vibration of energy into the universe. And if we are giving a vibration of same old, same old, nothing ever changes, then what are we really saying about the universe? Especially if we are acknowledging that we are individualized incarnations of the one then let's anthropomorphize God for a minute. When does God get to say, oh, I made all this stuff and, eh. <laughs> I mean, let's go to Genesis for a moment. And in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light and God made platypuses, which I still don't understand, but and, God's blood and all this stuff. And at the end of each of these days, God said, and it was good. Didn't say, ha, ah, I've made the sun and the stars and the moon. And yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we do. We do that exact thing. 
We always have this moment of choice point of saying, am I choosing what is in my highest and best? Or am I choosing based upon some pattern of belief that was yesterday or yesterday's yesterday? Just because I was an abused child and just because I experienced great torment and pain growing up and just because I was bullied does not mean I have to live and move and have my beingness from that place. How often do we say things like, and I heard someone, very famous person, I'm not going to say her name right now, but she said something one time and it didn't sit well with me when she referred to a certain other celebrity by saying, once an abuser, always an abuser. Well, if that's the case, then once a thief, always a thief? Once a criminal, always a criminal? Then why bother with rehabilitation of people in penitentiaries and prisons? Why bother? If we know that they can't change, ah, or, or do we know that they can? So what does it say then when I speak into existence this idea that I have to be this recording of whatever my past was. Now see, table the spiritual stuff for a second and let's think about, let's have a minor, a, a tiny little history lesson for a moment. Any history buffs in the room? Yes, everybody in here is. Thank you for raising your hand, Don. At least somebody was bold enough to raise their hand. So I'm gonna give you a date and I'm gonna ask you to tell me like what, what, why is this date significant? And no, it's not your birthday. So, just, I'm just putting that out there just so you know. So, June 26th. 2015. Significant to anybody for any reason? Okay, let me give you a hint. Prior to this date, certain groups of people could not marry. Post that date, could. Forget the fact that there are those who are trying to change that. The point is, prior to, then after. So just because this was the precedent doesn't mean it's our reality now. Let's go with 1954, Board of Education, which Civil Rights Act 1964. So prior to where I sat on the bus, which fountain I drank at, which restaurant entrance I could go into was very different than Brian's. Now, we can sit at the same table, go in the same door, go see the same movies, and both act a fool together. And hold hands. <laughs> and hold hands, if we, as he said, if we choose to. <laughs> Just because there was a precedent doesn't mean things can't change. June 4th, 1919, there were several of you who could not vote. Women are now, so precedent. Women had a particular place governed based upon this male dominated. And now, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that word because it's gonna record, but yes. But now things have changed. So we have even in our regular, everyday, gross world of tangible, feelable stuff, evidence that says precedent is not the binding thing. Even when we talk about something as simple as the law of gravity, we all understand the law of gravity, but our understanding of the law of gravity as adults is very different than understanding the law of gravity as a toddler. <laughs> For most of us. But it's the same law. The law itself hasn't changed. But the individual and how the individual uses the law and maneuvers with the law and embodies the law is what gives the same law of gravity the ability to make a gymnast fly through the air. Or make us watch the Olympics when people do whew, that thing where they, whew, they get at the top of the, the sliding board and all they got is like skis. and. Whew, my mind still can't wrap around that, but, but that thing. And we sit back and we marvel at it. But they're using the law of gravity to be able to do this. So here we are, these spiritual folks who understand that there is this spiritual law and principle that says, if we believe it, it is done unto us as we believe. Do we believe that? Because if we do believe it, 
then shouldn't we become extremely skilled at being excellent stewards of our minds? To the degree that if I ask you, what does it mean we believe in the direct revelation of truth through our intuitive and spiritual nature? Pause. What does that mean for you? Doesn't matter what Brian or I or anyone else tells you that this means, because it's what it means for us. Because the moment I say, I love chocolate cake, somebody else in here is going to say, eh, strawberry shortcake is better. We have different taste buds and experiences. So it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what a practitioner says. It matters what you understand. Emma Curtis Hopkins says, the only degree that we are going to ever understand God is the degree that we understand ourselves. So if we see, for example, let's go back to my former Baptist days. If I can only see myself as a sinner that is saved by grace but truly unworthy, the only reason is because God took pity sort of kind of on me. But to the degree that God so loved me that he was willing to kill his own child for me. Like, what does that do to my psyche? Right. So my understanding of God has to then be some twisted kind of punishing something. Ugh. I can't see that. And God made and God made and it was good and God made and it was good and God made and it was good, except for me. So now what does that now mean for us when we understand that that anthropomorphic deity does not exist? That love is that thing we call God, source, the universe. So what is it that we believe? Because we have a lot of beliefs in here that we never really sit and question. For example, lately I've been on this documentary thing. I've been watching documentaries like two or th I'm averaging two or three a week. And a couple of weeks ago, I was watching on Netflix a documentary called The Rachel Divide. Which was, ooh, which, <laughs> which was about the uh, woman who was the former NAACP president in Seattle, Washington, and found out that she was actually a white woman, and they were like, oh, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, I'm going to watch it. So I'm watching it. And I go through the, I go through the, the roller coaster of, ah, oh. Mm. <laughs> like, I, go, I, went, I went through it. There were moments in there, like, I went through it. But the thing is, I don't, it's not, I don't know it's about her. I don't even talk about her. The thing that came out of it for me was, referencing this thing of believing and beliefs and paradigms, is they asked several different people of color, several different black people, African-American people, whatever the term we're using. And the vast majority of them who were against her said, she doesn't get to be black because she didn't struggle. She doesn't know our pain and our struggle. And I understand. But what they're defining as this is only the struggle. I didn't hear any one of them say that there's this rich culture of family and community eating together and breaking bread together. None of them. It was struggle. She doesn't understand the struggle. She doesn't understand the pain. So my mind immediately went to and said, if I'm identifying my blackness, my African-Americanness by struggle, then technically I need to keep the struggle alive. If it's what identifies as me, then I have to have racism in order for this paradigm to continue. But then even beyond that, it made me start to question, well, what does it mean to be black or African-American? Since these are two terms that are with tomato, tomato. I, I, <clears throat> so then I have to determine what does it mean for me? Especially when I run into some people who tell me I'm not black enough. And I understand what they're saying. But the point is, I have to question for me, who is Ray? What is Ray? What is mine to do in each and every moment? Each of us is invited to do the same thing. We have 11 we believes. Go back to the one we believe in the direct revelation of truth. That means you individually can receive all direct revelation through your intuitive and spiritual nature. 
But do you know what that means for you? Because if you challenge your belief systems, then you get rid of all of those old, well, this is what it means. This is what, forgiveness is a really big thing for a lot of us. We don't like it. We don't like the concept of it. We think it's spiritual bypass most of the time or spiritual malpractice because I don't want to, I don't want to forgive the one who abused me, who raped me, who hurt me, who's hurting me, who's sitting somewhere in a huge power of office right now. I don't want to forgive. But we see forgiveness as somehow meaning Fine, Jesus said, forgive and turn the other cheek. We see forgiveness as this, it means I'm opening up and allowing myself to be hurt again. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is you're out in Arizona and there's a snake and the snake bites you. I don't care what you do to that snake. Kill it, burn it, toss it, or run from it. You've been bitten. Your number one priority is to get the venom out of you. That's forgiveness. Has nothing to do with the snake. But if we believe that forgiveness is about the snake, well, forgiveness means I'm supposed to hug the snake and feed the snake and somehow offer it my leg again to bite again somehow, then we die. That's not forgiveness. So the challenge once again, the invitation once again, is to question, what do I believe about the basic, simple, everyday, mundane things of my life? We shop where we shop because of something we believe about shoppers versus Weiss versus Food Lion versus wherever. We won't shop at Chick-fil-A or wherever based upon something we believe. We won't shop at Walmart based upon something we believe, or we will shop at Target because of something we believe. <laughs> Very simple things based upon what we are choosing to believe. And we don't really think about the whole choosing piece. I'm a Democrat. Why? I don't know. My parents were. Oh, I'm a Christian. Why? Because it's how I was raised. And you're how old now? 52. And, and, and you're, you're, so you still believe in Santa Claus? Oh, no. Mm -mm, no. But weren't you raised believing in Santa Claus? Oh, yeah. And the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny and the, but you don't believe in any of those anymore? Mm -mm. But you still believe in that anthropomorphic, okay. You get my point? There are a lot of things that we believe and carry, like uh, the, the gentleman, Ebenezer Scrooge's friend, uh, Jacob Marley, who's carrying yard by yard and chain by chain and link by link, all of these things that he had done, all of these beliefs that we carry that we don't even realize we're carrying until something happens. We don't know what we believe about death until some doctor, somebody says something that challenges our thing about death or until a family member, something. Then it's like, ooh, well, what, what, I, <clears throat> we don't know what we believe about food or whatever until some doctor tells us something about, well, there's cholesterol and there's, there's high blood pressure and there's hypertension and then no, 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 you should stop eating this and stop eating that. And then we're like, mm, no, I like my donuts. <laughs> Or, okay, fine. Until something happens to really rattle our cages, we go on as business as usual. Wash, rinse, repeat. Over and over and over again. Joel Goldsmith says that one of the things that slows us, or probably the thing that slows our spiritual progression the most, is that we have these old beliefs, and we try to lump new stuff on top of them. Old thoughts, new thoughts. Anybody ever seen Roadkill? It's not a movie. I'm talking about like driving down the road. And, and you get out and you take your, your perfume or your cologne and you spritz it, you know, to make the air fresher. Ah, it smells much better now. Really? Not really. <laughs> because it's decomposing. So those old thoughts, some of them serve us and they serve us very well, but some of them don't. Some of them are rotting and decomposing, and we still carry it. 
We still marinate on it. We still take whiffs of it. And we go about our business. And then we wonder, why am I not manifesting what I say that I want? Why is my life not changing? Why is my health still suffering? Or my relationships are still suffering? Or my money still? Like, why, 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 why? And the question is not why. The question is, what are you believing? What are you believing about this thing? How often do we say things like, well, when you change the way you look at things, then the things you look at change. Do we ever really sit down and, okay, well, what is it? What, I hear it. What exactly does that mean? And not just what does it mean, but how does that show up in my life? If I believe that heaven is within, that I'm going to experience it to the degree that I become conscious of it, then I'm going to do my damnedest every day to be more and more conscious of it. Because if I'm going to experience heaven, and it's my choice based upon how I am conscious of it and how I am in embodying it and living and moving and having my beingness from that awareness, then I'm going to do as much as I possibly can to let go of what is not serving that, to move into what is so that I am with every step. You know, you've ever seen those old movies or whatever when the people throw rose petals down so the king or queen can walk on the rose petals? And it's like, you are royalty. I want to leave rose petals in my wake. I want to move and by my steps, make the world a better place. We say we are going to make this a world that works for the highest and best of all. But if I'm not doing it for me, it doesn't matter what I'm saying about. It doesn't matter what I'm teaching about. Doesn't, none of that matters because I'm not being about it. I'm not walking the walk and talking the talk. So it comes down to, what am I doing individually with my paradigms and my belief systems? What am I doing to shine my light? What am I doing to be a healing and beneficial presence to the world? And for every time a thought comes up and says, but you're not good enough, you're not worthy, that's that old stuff. Somewhere in the past, there is never a baby born the day, boop, <laughs> I'm not worthy. It never happens. They have to learn it from someone, something, somewhere. So every idea we are holding, carrying, marinating on of, but I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve, is some link in some chain that someone gave us at some point and we took it and we may not have known then, but we can know now. And then we have the key the key is that thing called principle, called law, called science of mind. Open it, set ourselves free. Principle is not bound by precedent. We get to change and choose. Holmes says, talk amongst yourselves for a second. Don't rush me, don't rush me, don't rush me. Let's go, with, let's go with this one. When we realize that all the spiritual power there is, is at our disposal, and that no matter how limited a viewpoint we may have had yesterday, with the limitations that follow that viewpoint, today we can increase our field of inward awareness. Then we make possible a great influx of the divine through the human, that is through our own thinking. Right here, a certain amount of adventure, of imagination, must be brought into play to create a feeling of acceptance which will break down these old patterns of beliefs. We have the ability to shift, change, transform, transmogrify, transcend, like all of that. We have the ability to do so. But we have to be willing, we have to question, we have to ask. What is mine to do in this moment with this thought, with this belief? Question it all. Don't let any thought, idea, paradigm, anything just roll by without, why are you here? 
there, there's a television show Tracy and I recently started watching called The Originals, and it's a spinoff, as my, one of my sons told me, from a television show called The Vampire Diaries. So we watched the pilot of Vampire Diaries last night. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because vampires don't come into your home, your space, without your invitation. We get to choose what thoughts get to come into and stay in. We get to choose what people get to come in and stay in. We get to choose. There's a story that I've been telling recently because of what it's been doing in my own mind that Ram Dass tells about Haruman. Haruman. My Indian is a little off. Hindi is off. But the idea is Haruman is the, Indi is the monkey god. And the monkey god and Rama, Ram, are, and Ram is the supreme, they're having this conversation. And Ram says, monkey, what are you? And Haruman says, well, when I don't know who I am, I am your servant. When I know who I am, I am you. When we know who we are, we know we are the I am. And when we know we are the I am, then there is nothing back there that binds us. The only thing that can hold us prisoner, hold us captive, hold us down, is us. Comic book, comic strip years ago, Pogo said, we have seen the enemy and the enemy is us. Well, I have seen the enemy and the enemy is us. What if there is no enemy though? Like what if we even transcend the idea that there is an enemy? Because one of the things we say is, God is all there is. And good is ever present. Then that means even when I see something that is experiencing or demonstrating discord, disharmony, and I mean the most vile of things, am I able to understand and see it for what it is, but also understand that on some level, somewhere, some way, some shape, some form, that that young man that shot up that school has to also be God. And as painful and as difficult as it is when feeling the anger, feel the anger, acknowledge the anger, but understand that on some level he has to be. Otherwise, we are setting up some form of cognitive dissonance. And if we are going to move and live and have our beingness from this idea of cognitive dissonance, then all of this becomes hypocrisy. We're either all in or we're all out. Be hot or be cold, not lukewarm. And we get to choose. Let's pray. Grounding ourselves and simply breathing. Knowing that this breath, this inhale and this exhale is not simply each of us breathing ourselves, but the divine, that which is God, the one, breathing itself as us. And so from this place of knowing that that next breath is already there and that this breath that is released goes where it goes without our concern, without us needing to hold or cling, from this place of absolute surrender, I speak these words, knowing God is all there is. One power, one presence, one mind. And this one mind is God's mind. And that mind is magnificent and glorious and powerful and loving and love-filled and beyond anything that the human mind can even fathom. And that mind is my mind right now. And so all that it is must be incarnate right here, in, through, and as me. And if it is true for me, it must be true for everyone in this room, this building, this city, this planet, and beyond. This is why I know that this isn't going to become a world that works for the highest and best of all, but that it is already that, because it is already in the mind of God. And if it is already in the mind of God, then it already exists. So my invitation is to live and breathe and have my beingness knowing this truth, living this truth, that I see every man, woman, and child as my family, my brother, my sister, 
my child, my nephew, my niece, my uncle, my grandparents, one, one family being breathed by God. Moving forward, I understand and I know that whatever I am experiencing in my body temple is already healed, is already whole, is already perfect. I claim it in the same way that I claim all that God is as me. And in gratitude, I speak this. In gratitude, I feel this. In gratitude, I place it back into the law from whence it came because I know these are not the words of Raymond, but these are the words of the I am, speaking about itself, speaking through itself, and now placing these words back into that one loving, complete, law-filled mind. The seed placed in soil now must receive and grow and demonstrate accordingly. It can be no other way. And so knowing this, I know it is done, released and complete. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you.